Amen. All right, so we're here in 1 Kings chapter number 19. And just to give you a background of what's happening, if you go back to, you don't have to turn there, but if you go back to chapter 17, what's going on is that Elijah makes a uh, declaration to the children of Israel that it's not going to rain for three and a half years. So it didn't rain. He ends up meeting, uh, pretty much all the water dries up and they have a drought. So he ends up meeting a la lady in Zarephath where she ends up giving him some food and he does a miracle by raising her son from the dead and then also by providing her with the food that she needed. So then in the next chapter, in verse, chapter 18, uh, Elijah ends up taking on the prophets of Baal. And when he takes them on, they, he pretty much gives them a challenge that uh, if they... He pretty much he was saying for fire to come down. If they if their God is real, then fire should come down to heaven and uh, uh, consume this sacrifice or an animal. And he said, if my God's real, then he'll have fire come down from heaven. So as we already know the story, he ended up the prophets of Baal. They weren't able to have fire come down from heaven. They tried to cut themselves and call upon their God, but their God didn't hear them. The devil didn't hear them. So therefore, they weren't able to do that. But then. Uh, Elijah ends up praying to God, and then once he prays to God, fire comes down from heaven. It consumes that sacrifice, and then he ends up killing, I believe, 450 prophets of Baal. So uh, we're in 1 Kings 19. Look at verse 1, and it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the God's do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So what's going on is that Elijah or Jezebel hears, Ahab tells Jezebel what, what went on, and then she wants to kill Elijah for just everything that happened. So Elijah, even though he had this great ver victory in the last chapter, he ended up getting up and running away. So in verse 4 it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So it gets to the point that even though he had this great victory that Elijah just gets so depressed that Jezebel wants to kill him, that he wishes for himself to die. He tells God, just take my life. I'm no better than my father's. So it says in verse 5, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then the, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head and he did eat and drink and laid him down again and the angel of the lord came again the second time and touched him and said arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee and he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto horeb the mount of god so it wasn't god's will for elijah just to sit and be depressed. So he ends up giving him the provisions that he needed so that he can go meet with the Lord in Mount Horeb. So in verse 9 it says, And it came, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And where I uh, derived the title of my sermon comes from verse 10 where it says this, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the title of my sermon is this. It's called Having Eye Problems. Now, this isn't a problem with actual visions. It's just a play on words for those who didn't catch it yet. But it's not just a problem with having vision problems. It's actually having a problem in the heart of being self-centered. And we can see in this passage that Elijah, he was so depressed, and he's thinking that he's the only person serving God. Let's look back at what he says. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord 
God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he thinks he's the only person who's left. Even though he's done all this stuff, he's thrown down the altars of Baal, he's fought against Jezebel and the false prophets and killed them, he still, he thinks he's the only one taking a stand for God. And that's not true, and we'll find that out later in the passage. But what I want to preach against is just having that self Centered attitude that you're the only person in this life or that I'm the only person who's going to get the world saved or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And we see that that's the same attitude that Elijah had and it's not a good attitude. And since this is a, I guess, more or less like a, a symptom or, or a disease, we're going to try to figure out ways of curing it. So uh, you're still staying in uh, 1 Kings chapter number 19 and look at verse 11. It says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said where dost do what doest thou here elijah and he said i have been very jealous for the lord god of hosts because the children of israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars slain thy prophets with the swords and i even i only am left and they seek my life to take it so Twice in this chapter, he re reiterates the same thing, that I'm the only person serving God. I'm the only one doing this. I'm the only one taking a stand. And that's not true. Now, the Lord says to him in verse 15, it says, and the Lord said unto him, Go return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mihola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that he, that him that escapeth the sword of Hazio shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And look at verse 18, it says this, Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So what God is telling him is this, is that first of all, he has three guys who are still serving God. He has Haziel, he has uh, Jehu, and he has Elisha. And then on top of that, he has 7,000 other guys that still have not bowed the knee to Baal. So how can we apply this to this day and age? Because there are a lot of people who have the... Uh, weird mentality that they're the only person serving God. And that's not true. There are other people out there that are serving God. There are other churches, not just churches, you know, affiliated with us and, you know, churches that we fellowship with. There are other churches doing the work of God. And people like to have some a weird mentality that, you know, it's only faithful word and other churches that are going to save the world. And yeah, we have that big burden to reach the lost and we have the big burden to get the gospel around the world because we see that's lacking in a lot of churches. But there are other churches that do soul winning. There are other churches that serve God. And you're not the only one serving God. I'm not the only one serving God. There are many churches out there that are preaching the right gospel and they're getting a lot of people saved. And that's where my first point is this, is that there's the problem of the I mentality, that I'm the only one. And we're not the only ones serving God. I can think of many great churches out there that came before us and then even churches in this day and age that are doing a lot for God. Now, I'll admit this. You know, I believe Faithful Word Baptist Church has the best methods of reaching the lost. I think we have the clearest gospel presentation. I think we have uh, a really good missions program where we just go into a country and get as many people as we can get saved. I think how we start churches is good. I think that Faithful Word has the best plan to, to reach the lost, but there are other churches that do the same thing. There are other churches that are out serving God. There are other churches that have their ministries, like a lot of churches, which I don't agree with the bus ministry, but they have bus ministries. And what they do is they bring all these kids to church. And what the kids end up doing is they, they have them, I guess they take them to whatever class or, and they end up preaching to them. And some of those kids get saved. And 
the kids are still getting saved in these things, even though we may not agree with those methods, even though we may not think those methods are right. We have to admit that, yeah, there are still people outside of Faith Forward Baptist Church that are getting saved. And there are a lot of people with that m weird mentality that we're the only people reaching the lost. So I remember hearing someone say that it's like, you know, people in our movement, the new IFB, get 90 percent of the world saved. I, I would definitely say I disagree with that because I don't think we're getting 90 percent of the people saved. I mean, think about when you're out soul and you talk to someone who's already saved. They have nothing to do with our church. They don't even know what our church is. So we can't have this we're the only one mentality because right. I think it's a wrong mentality because it what it does, it locks out good churches where they don't want to have fellowship with us because they think we're just these arrogant jerks where or people that they think that Oh, well, Faithful Word Baptist Church doesn't want us to have fellowship with them. And a lot of churches don't want to have fellowship. It's the other way around. They don't want to have fellowship with us. But then, nonetheless, we should be people that at least try to be, be welcoming to other people who want to serve God with us and not just have this weird mentality that they don't get people saved. Because I think since our gospel presentation is so clear and many people get saved when we present the gospel to them we think other churches don't have a clear presentation and it's it's true to a certain extent but there are other churches that do preach the gospel they preach the right gospel and even without those churches i mean i think of like the house crowd and uh curtis hudson they came before us they had the right gospel they're getting tons of people saved probably even more than we got saved but what I'm getting at is this, is that there are other people out there getting saved, uh, getting other churches out there getting saved. And we just shouldn't have the wrong mentality that, hey, we're the only ones doing the work of God when it's not true. There are other ones out there. And, you know, our our goal is to provoke them onto good works, that they can go out and do the same things we do and have more effective soul winning, more effective missions programs and things like that. Now, go with me to Luke chapter number nine, Luke chapter number nine. And someone I think about when, with this example is I think about uh, some guys that were going to our church, but they ended up doing a mission trip to Uganda. And when they got there, because I did the mission trip to Uganda prior to them going there. And when I got there, uh, one of my buddies and I, we ended up going to a church that was in Uganda. And the church was packed with different people. The guy, I don't know exactly how long he's been there, but let's just say maybe about 10 years. But he had a full church. I mean, he had a hundred people going to his service. He, they were getting people saved. These people had the right gospel, right salvation. And you know what? They didn't even know who our church was. So for someone to sit there and just say that only faithful words getting people saved, I just don't think it's the right mentality. We have to understand that there are other people out there doing the work of God. It says in Luke 9, if you're there and look at verse 49, John answered, and John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him because he followed not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now, Jesus is speaking truth here because he's saying that if someone's not against us, then just leave them alone. And that's the easy thing. Now, there are a lot of stances that we take that I totally agree with the stance. Like, for instance, the stance against homos not being allowed in church. I think that's a good stance. And there are other churches that have that same stance. I think of there's a church recently uh, where the pastor at the church posted a video saying that, yeah, if someone uh, uh, molests some person or takes advantage of some child, you know, someone at church, they shouldn't be allowed in the pulpit anymore. They should go and get elsewhere. Well, they had the right attitude, but they don't want to have fellowship with us, and which is fine. If they're getting people saved, if they're doing the work of God, then we shouldn't worry about that. And that's what Jesus is saying here is that, hey, if they're not against us, then whatever. You know, let them do their, their thing. It says in Mark 9, verse 37, it says, Whosoever shall receive one, oh, sorry, verse 38, it says, And Jesus answered and said, Jesus answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us and we forbade him because he followed not us but jesus said forbid him not for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me so jesus it's the same it's pretty much the same passage in luke's just reiterate or said in a different way but he's saying that there's no one that can do a miracle in the name of christ or speak lightly in the name of christ with you know uh so if he's if he's doing miracles in the name of christ you don't have to worry about it he's not he's not if he's not speaking against me, then it's not that big of a deal. And I think Jesus had the right attitude, which everything Jesus did was perfect, but he had the right attitude that, hey, even if someone's not fellowshipping with us, if someone's not um, 
you know, on board with all the stuff we do, we can still, they can still get the work of God done and we can both accomplish that goal of getting the gospel around the whole world. Now, another thing is this, and I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 14, Isaiah 14, is that I think another reason why uh, Elijah was so depressed was that he, he thought he was the only one serving God and therefore it became really overwhelming that, hey, I think I'm the only one serving God. And that's why he got so depressed. And a lot of us can get that way because the world's a big world. I mean, we have what, like, uh, it's almost close to 8 billion, 7, 8 billion people in this world. We're not going to get all those people saved, even in our lifetime. It's going to be hard. And you know what? We have to rely on other churches to do it. We try our best. We're, si we're doing everything we can with the resources that we have to get the job done. I mean, for instance, this church, we've gotten almost half, not even half, more than half of the uh, Native American reservations or the Indian res, uh, reservations knocked. Yeah. And no other church is doing that. So that's something I, I think our church is, what our church is doing is great. And I wish other churches would get on board, but there are other churches that in their local area, they're doing whatever they can do to, get the, to, to do the work of God. But I think it would become overwhelming to us to think that, well, we are the only people who can get people saved. We're the only people who can get the gospel out. And I just don't think it's the right idea. I think we should worry about, I, I do think we should have goals and worry about our areas and other areas, but I think that if someone, you know, if there's some small podunk town and there's a Baptist church there, and if they're getting people saved, then praise God. But if they're not, then that's not fully our problem. You know, that church is there. If they're not accomplishing the Great Commission in their area, then shame on them. It's that simple. Now, my next point is this, is uh, found in Isaiah 14. And if you look at Isaiah 14, 10, this is the eye problem of being lifted up with pride. And we could see this in the devil. It says in Isaiah 15 or 14, 10, it says, All they sp shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and thy, the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worm covered thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high God." And if you look in the dictionary, it says right next to that. Or if you have a cross-reference Bible, it says Kanye West. Just giving you out, <laughs> putting that out there. <laughs> so what is Satan saying, or what is Kanye saying? He's saying this. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt, exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wants to be like God. That was Satan's downfall is that he wanted to be just like God. And look, he wasn't like God. He never would be like God. And that's why he, was ended, he ended up being brought down. But a lot of us have that same prideful attitude that we want to be lifted up. We want people to see how great we are, whether it's in our soul winning, whether it's in our preaching, whether it's in just the things we do. And we don't want our hearts to be lifted up with pride. Because why? Why don't we want our hearts to be lifted up with pride? It's because we're going to be destroyed. Anyone whose heart is lifted up with pride, they will be brought down. Look at Kanye here in verse 15. It says, or sorry, Satan, well, well the same person. <laughs> Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the, the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not, his, opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. Now, we see in this passage that what, Jesus, what God's saying to Satan is that he's going to be brought down to hell to the size of the pit. And if you remember reading in Matthew, what did Jesus say? He says, go, uh, go to, to everlasting torment reserved for the devil and his angels. 
the devil, because of his pride, was brought down even to the point that he sinned against God. And not only that he sinned against God, that he, he ended up, he, he's reserved onto hell for all eternity. And a person can get in that, that way where they want to lift themselves up and think they're better than everyone. And what's going to happen when you have that attitude, when you have that I problem of I want to do this, I want to be a pastor, I want to, you know, people to see how great a person I am. Well, what's going to happen is eventually you're going to be brought down low. Now, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter number four. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read a few verses. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 4, it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, this is the office of a bishop or a pastor. And it says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And that's the thing with people who are novices. They, ended, they end up being lifted up with pride. We were talking about this earlier today, but I remember just after I got saved, I remember just being really prideful just because I thought I knew everything, just because I was hearing good preaching. I felt like I was the only person at my church going soul winning. I felt like I was the only person serving God. And you know what that ended up doing? That ended up lifting me up, making me think that, hey, I'm, I know more than my pastor who's been pastoring for, you know, I think at that time he's pastoring for like 12 years and I've only been saved for like a few months. And that can get to you. Knowledge will puff puff up a person. And that's why the Bible's saying if you're going to set up someone as a pastor, you shouldn't set up someone who's a novice. Why is that? Because they're going to be lifted up with, pri in, uh, with pride and you're going to fall into the condemnation of the devil because the devil wants you to fall. That's his goal is that he doesn't want the work of God to continue. So he's going to do his best to try to bring people down. And the easiest way to bring someone down is through their own pride because the easiest way to destroy some is just through themselves. It's, it's hard to like, sometimes you can destroy people in other ways, but the easiest way for the devil to destroy someone is just using themselves against them. And the easiest way to do that is with pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, pride will destroy you. And when someone has that I problem of I want to be lifted up, I want to uh, uh, show other people that I'm this great person, well, eventually you're going to get brought down. We see that here in Daniel chapter number four, where I've had you turn with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had some weird dream and he needed Daniel to interpret it. Daniel interpreted it and he was showing that this is judgment against him. And I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar understood that or not, but everything that Daniel interpreted in that dream came to pass. And we see in verse 28, it says, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So what is Nebuchadnezzar saying? He's not he's like, Isn't this the kingdom that I built up for the might of my power and for the power of my or the honor of my majesty? What is he lifted up with? He's lifted up with pride. He's saying, look at all the stuff I did. Look at the kingdom I built. Look at all the great things I've done. And the thing is, God put him in this position. It wasn't himself. You know, he didn't have the power to put himself in the position. God put him in the position because God wanted him to destroy the children of Judah because of their sins. And he lifted up Nebuchadnezzar to do that. But what did Nebuchadnezzar see it as? Oh, well, look at this kingdom that I built. Look at all these, con these uh, territories that I conquered. And what happens to Neb Nebuchadnezzar? Well, Nebuchadnezzar ends up being destroyed. It says in verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with beast, with the beast of the field. They shall make thee eat to eat grass as oxen, and seven ties shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. So we see that after the thing that sparked 
got his destruction was him being lifted up, him being lifted up with pride. And that's what ended up making him lose his mind and then losing his kingdom. Now, it says this in verse 34, at the end of the day, at, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes onto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the most high God, the most high and praised him and praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So after him, after being humbled, after going through all this, Nebuchadnezzar being brought down low, what does he end up doing? He ends up praising God. He ends up, I believe Nebuchadnezzar did get saved after this, and he ends up understanding that, hey, I can't lift myself up anymore. I can't be a prideful person. It says this in verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride he is able to abase. And what ends up happening is this. After... Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself after Nebuchadnezzar goes through this. What does he do? He ends up becoming humble. And what does he get? He gets his kingdom back until later on when he dies. But he learned a lesson from this that if he gets lifted up with pride, if he lifts himself up, he thinks he looks at what the things that God's given him. He looks at his kingdom and says, look at all the stuff I did. He has that eye problem. Then what ends up happening? He's brought down and God was able to abase him. And even as believers, the same thing can happen to us. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Deuteronomy 8. And when you get there, look at verse 10. Deuteronomy 8, 10. Because even as believers, we can have things go right for us. And because things go right all the time, then we end up being lifted up and that can bring our destruction. The Bible says in De Deuteronomy 8, 10, When thou hast eaten and art, and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and the statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thy, thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So what God is saying is this, once I let you get in this, this land, don't get lifted up. You know, everything starts going good for you. You start your cattle increase, your money increases, everything that you have is increasing. And then don't let your heart get lifted up where you forget about me. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians when good things happen, when they get, you know, say they get a raise at their job or just a lot of the time in general, people usually seek God in hard times. And then when those hard times, they seek God more than when the things are going good. And God's saying he doesn't want you to forget him because if your heart gets lifted up, then you'll forget that God was the one who gave you all these things. Now, in verse 15, it says, who led thee who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and trout, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou shalt say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And God's just reiterating it, 
this, that when people get rich, when they get a lot of money, when they get a lot of wealth, they forget about God. And who do they think they they who do they think is the one who got the wealth? They think it's themselves. And that's how a lot of rich people are. They you know, I remember talking to a guy I worked with. I tried to give him the gospel and he I said, hey, do you go to church? I just even asked that simple question. You know, what he told me he said Sundays are my days. And that's what he said. And the guy was he had a pretty good job. He had a pretty good position because he didn't care about God. He didn't know that, hey, God was the one who actually is letting you breathe that air you're breathing right now to get mad at him and saying that Sundays are my days. And. He he. Uh, and, you know, God's the one who's given them the power to even work at that job. And that's how a lot of even just and the guy wasn't a Christian, but that's how a lot of Christians are. They start working on Sundays. They start forgetting God. They 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 move to a church like Faithful Word from, you know, some far away land. And then they end up getting out of church because of work, because they're too consumed on money. And I believe God's able to provide for someone in times of need when they you know when things happen and that they don't if they stay true and faithful to the things of God that God's able to bless that person now it says this in verse 19 and it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. So the thing is, if you forget God, God's going to bring you down. That's the simple thing about it is that if you forget God, you think, oh, look at me. I'm lifted up because I have all this money. I've got I've done all this thing, these things in my life. Well, in the end, God will bring you down just as quick as you got up, even quicker. So it's just something we need to take heed to. In our lives. Now go with me to Second Chronicles chapter number twenty six. Second Chronicles twenty six. And we can actually see a real life example of someone in the Bible that God was working with them, God was helping or he was walking with them, God was blessing this person, but that person ended up getting lifted up and then he ended up it ended up bringing his destruction. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 3, or sorry, 26, 3, the Bible reads and says, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jokaliah of Jerusalem. And in verse 4, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And that's the same thing with you. It's not always just money that makes you prosper. If you seek God, then God will make you prosper. And that's what we see happen to Uzziah. He had his heart right. He did that which is right in God's eyes. He sought God all the days of a prophet that was there with him, and God made him to prosper. And it says this in verse 6, And he went forth and warred against the Philistines, and brake down the wall of Gath, and the wall of Jebna, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod, and among the Philistines. And it says in verse 7, And God helped him against the Philistines, and against the Arabians that dwelt at Gerbal, and the Mehanims. And the Amorites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. And we can see in this passage that God's helping this man, God's blessing this man, God's using this man. Now, go down to verse 16. If you look down to verse 16, it says this, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of, or yeah, to burn incense upon the altar of incense. So God's blessing this man. God's using this man. He's doing as much as he can for this guy. But then what happens when he's strong? He gets lifted up in pride. And what does it say? His heart was lifted up to his destruction. And the point I'm getting at is this, is that what goes up must come down. So once your pride goes up, then your destruction, you're going to be brought down low. And that's what happens. That's what ended up happening to King Uzziah is that God's working in his life. God's doing as much as he can for him. And the guy ends up getting so lifted up that God has to end up destroying him. And he actually brought upon himself his own destruction. So how can we apply this today? Well, think about it like this. You know, churches where 
the, the pastor uses all these weird methods to get into church. You know, he has a humble beginning, but then he starts bringing in all these worldly things to try to build his church. Well, that church is eventually going to be destroyed. That's why a lot of these weird uh, new evangelical churches, they start having all these... Uh, uh, um, I guess I'm trying to think of the right word. It's they start having all these controversies that are that their church is involved in, where someone starts molesting people in the church, or the pastor ends up, you know, being a drunk and gets kicked out. Because these people are probably think a lot of them are thinking in their head, well, look at all the church, how I built this church. Look at all the you know the people I brought in. They don't give God a bone, you know, on that. They end up thinking. Oh, I did this myself, and that's what's going to bring their destruction. Or same, like with us as believers, out soul winning. Just think about the times where you're just getting person saved, 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 like every day, every other day. You just every time you go out soul winning, someone's getting saved. You know, you can get lifted up thinking that, well, you know, I must be a good talker, I must be a good soul winner, I must be a good guy. That's why I'm able to get so many people saved. And I believe God brings it in your life where sometimes you have dry streaks of when you're out soul winning, where you don't get someone saved for you know weeks and sometimes even months on end just to keep you humble to know that hey it's not by your power that you're getting people saved it's actually by my power it's by me that you're getting saved people saved not by the things that you're doing and oftentimes like when i'm out soul winning and i just see someone who's rough uh or who looks rough i i think in my head i'm just like my goal is just to at least open the bible and show them how to get to heaven i'm not gonna you know, I try to make salvation clear to people, but my goal is just to at least get the Bible open because I know the Word of God has power and has enough power to get someone saved, whether I put my two cents in it or not. And we should have that same attitude that when we're out soul winning that, oh, well, it's not my elaborate soul winning presentation that's getting people saved. No, it's the Word of God. Now, all you're doing is just helping them understand it a little better. But in the end, it's the power, it's the Word of God that a person saved, not by your elaborate or just really this, this nice, fluffy presentation. Now, I'm trying to remember where I was at. Uh, go down to verse 20, or let's look at verse 18. The Bible reason it says, And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priest, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth, the priest with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the, the, the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to get out, because the Lord had smitten him." And Uzziah the king was a leper on leper unto this day, unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So we see in this, because of Uzziah's pride, the 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 priests are saying, "Hey, don't go in, don't burn offers uh, or incense on the altar. You, this is not for you to do. This is for." the priest to do, and what does he do? He doesn't listen. And that's a prideful person is when you try to correct someone and they don't want to take correction. And the only way you can get ahead in this life is by being someone who takes correction the right way. And we see that in with Uzziah, that he wasn't someone who was willing to take correction. They're telling him not to do something. He gets mad and he goes, he does it anyway. And that's something that gets me really annoyed, especially like just at my job and working with people is when you try to correct someone and they don't take that correction. That's like the worst thing or it's just really annoying. Or you're trying to tell someone to do something the right way and they just ignore you because they think they're a know it all because that person is lifted up with pride. That's why they don't want to be someone who takes correction. And we as Christians, if we're doing something wrong, we should be willing to take correction. You know, I think about out soul winning a lot of the time and you tell someone hey this is a better way of doing it because i i don't do that often because i think someone's presentation is something that molds or it's you know they mold to make 
however they want to present the gospel in a way that they feel is effective. But there are some things that are more effective than others. And sometimes you'll see beginners go out and go soul winning and then you'll hear them say stuff or they'll start getting into debates and when you've been soul winning for a long enough time you understand that you shouldn't just uh, start debating with people and start arguing with people but you'll correct them on things like that you'll say hey I think you should do this and they'll say well your way works but mine doesn't someone told me that the other day and I just thought that was the rudest thing that I said hey you don't always have to tell someone when you're trying to give them the gospel that they're unsaved because I don't think that's super effective we know that they're unsaved a lot of the time they think they're saved and what you have to do is convince them that they're not saved so that they can get saved and what that, that process comes with you presenting them the whole gospel. That's the way they'll find out they're not safe. Well, I told them, hey, you don't have to tell, like if you, you say, hey, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? They give you all the right answers and then you say, well, you're just, hey, you're, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're unsaved. Just saying that, I just don't think it's a good method. I think it's good to go over the gospel, show them, hey, now this is why you're unsaved and then at that point they can understand okay I see where you're coming from just telling them right off the bat I don't think it helps and I'm talking to this guy and saying that and I'm saying look you know I think that's the better method he was like well this is how I see it he's just like well you can talk to someone tell them that they're unsaved and then they're gonna be like wow this guy told me that I'm unsaved now I'm gonna get saved you know now I'm willing to listen I've, I've never seen that happen for the years I've been soul winning I think it's good just to show them the Word of God and let the Word of God change their heart but I didn't like how I'm trying to just and I'm not even saying because my how I feel about it is the guy can do whatever he wants but I'm just trying to tell him how to be more effective as a soul winner because as soon as you tell someone that hey you're unsaved you know what it starts it starts a debate and you start going back and forth and start throwing verses at this person and they start throwing verses at you and what ends up happening you get nowhere and I've seen that happen many times out soul winning where you're going back and forth that's why I try to just say hey can I show you what the Bible says about getting to heaven if they say no then I just move on and go to someone else who wants to listen instead of getting into some debate but the thing that got me was that he said well this is like the nine six thing he's like you what you're what you're telling me is a nine and then what I'm telling you is a six but ultimately they're the same thing and I'm like no they're not and at that point you know I felt like the guy was just he's not gonna listen and I was just like whatever but we should be people who take correction yeah. and especially out soul winning if someone's saying now there's some people I've been corrected by out soul winning like they've corrected me and I'm just like I'm like what you know they're saying I've I asked the person too many questions while I was just going over hey are you a sinner are you 100 percent or do you do you believe you deserve to go to hell what does it take to get to heaven and how long are you safe for I asked those four questions they said I asked too many questions like well what what should I ask at that point <laughs> you know it's like so there are some criticisms and some corrections that just don't make any sense and usually those people who just want to be nitpicky and correct every little thing they're prideful themselves but what I'm saying is this but if someone's giving you good sound advice especially someone who's been doing something for a long time then you should take that correction in stride you shouldn't be some prideful person that gets lifted up and say no one can show me anything you know even when I go out soul winning I like to go with different people so I can learn different things I've been soul winning for like almost 10 years now and I'm still picking up new things that I feel if I just go with the right person they can you know it can help improve my soul winning it can help me be able to be a better soul winner and that's the right attitude anyone should have and that's what's going to keep you humble now my last point is this I want you to go to James chapter number four because the title of the sermon is called having eye problems and those eye problems are it's mostly about you being self-centered thinking that hey I'm the only person serving God I'm the only person doing this I'm the other per only person doing that and there are other soul winners out there there are other churches doing the work of God and you know we can let them do their thing they can do we can do ours and we can all get the 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 goal of God accomplished you know of getting people saved getting people into his kingdom because think about it like this let's just say oh well we're the only people well what if say you go to some podunk town for a soul winning marathon and you find out like a bunch of the people are already saved so that whatever church was there was already doing all the work for you so you don't have to worry about going there you can just go somewhere else and be more effective there my second point is this is that we shouldn't be lifted up with pride we shouldn't be like the devil saying I'm gonna be exalted I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that you uh, you know I'm gonna lift myself up because when you lift yourself up the Bible says you are going to be brought down and that's goes for anyone 
And I see it a lot in new believers more than people who have been in church for a long time. And something like we were talking about earlier, again, is that the thing that's going to help humble you is going to a church, is go actually getting inside of a church and serving God with the people in the church because you'll learn, hey, I actually don't know as much as I thought I knew. I, I actually am not as great of a soul winner. I'll admit, you know, when I was... Uh, back in Georgia, I thought I was a good soul winner. I'm like, you know, going out soul winning on a regular basis. I'm thinking I'm preaching the gospel really well. And then when I moved to Faithful Word, I was just like, whoa, you know, my soul winning is not that great. You know, I'm taking too long. I'm not getting a point across. And it improved after I moved here once I got into a better church. So it's something that we need to think about. And we shouldn't just be lifted up and think we're just this big shot. We should be people who are humble and always willing to take correction and learn from other people. Now, the Bible says in, so the cure for these eye problems, you know, the eye problem of being self-centered, the eye problem of pride is just to be humble. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Now, I've had you turn to James chapter number, I didn't have it in my notes, but James chapter number four. And when you get there, look at verse eight, James 4, 8. The Bible reads and it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The way to actually get lifted up is by being humble. That's the only way. Once you humble yourself in God's sight, then you will be lifted up by God. God will be able to bless you in ways that you can't even imagine. The Bible says, I want you to turn to Luke 18. And while you're turning to Luke 18, I'm going to read from 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. You go to Luke 18, but I'm going to actually read from 2 Chronicles 32. And in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 24, the Bible reads, and it says, In those days, Uzziah, or, sorry, in those days Hezekiah was sick unto death, and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up, therefore there was wrath upon him, and upon Judah and Jerusalem. So what happens with Hezekiah is that if you've read both in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, there are parallel chapters, but what's going on is that Hezekiah is sick unto death. He gets so sick that he's almost going to die. So he ends up humbling himself, praying to God, talks to Isaiah, and then God says, I'm going to add 15, I believe it's 15 more years to your life. So that day that God said that, he made that proclamation, Hezekiah ended up getting 15 years onto his life. And you know what Hezekiah did after God added those things, th those years to his life? If we read this passage again, he ends up getting lifted up because it says, but he Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. So when God healed him, he didn't uh, give God the glory for that, but it says that for his, uh, benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up, Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. So he, even though God blessed him, God added years to his life, Hezekiah didn't thank God and he ended up getting lifted up. But what we see here in verse 26 is this. It says, notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so the so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. So the good thing is this, is that Hezekiah saw that he was getting prideful. He saw that he was lifting himself up. So you know what he did? He ended up humbling himself and humbling the people around him so that God's wrath was not poured on him during his time. So that's the same thing as us, is that when we start seeing ourselves think that we're these great people, you know what we need to do? We need to check ourselves and try to get ourselves brought down low and humble ourselves. Now, I had you turn to Luke 18 and look at verse 9. Luke 18, 9. 
the Bible reads, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So Jesus is speaking to a specific crowd, and these are this is the crowd which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. So you know what these people were doing? They thought they were big shots. They thought they were keeping God's commandments. They thought they were these great people, and they were looking down on other people. And he gives an example of a parable just to kind of give these guys uh, an understanding of what he's saying. It says in verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. So, we have these two guys, a Pharisee and a publican, and the Pharisee is just praising himself. He says the, pr the, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He's not even praying to God, he's praying with himself, and he's saying, God, and look at all the eyes that he says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So this guy is super self-centered. He's thinking about all the great things he d he's done. He's a person who's righteous in his own eyes. And you know what this makes me think of? The repenting your sins crowd. Oh, well, you know, I'm why I'm going to heaven is because I gave up drinking. It's because I gave up fornication. I gave up smoking. I gave up this. I gave up that. And then they think they're righteous or more righteous than other people who are humble because why? They know that God is what gets them into heaven, and that's why it's the opposite. People who are lifted up by all the things that they do, they end up going to hell because they're not trusting in Christ alone. And the people who are saying, well, I'm not that great of a person, you know, God be merciful to me, a sinner, they end up going to heaven because they have their faith in Christ because they know that they can't do anything without Christ. Right. Now, it says in verse 13, and the publican standing afar off would not lift so much as his eyes onto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this publican had the right attitude. He said he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven because he was so humble that he said, and he smote upon his breast, and he just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's the attitude we should have is that, hey, God, we're not, we're not as we're not big shots like we think we are. We are humble in your sight, and we want to just serve you. And we let God humble us. We humble ourselves and then God will humble us and then we will end up being lifted up. It says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts in himself shall be abased and he that humble of himself shall be exalted. If you want to be exalted by God, if you want to be lifted up by God, if you want to do great things for God, the only way you're going to do that is by having a humble attitude. You shouldn't be worrying about what other churches are doing. You should do what you can to serve God. You shouldn't think of yourself as a better person than other people. You should just serve God in the way that you can. And what God's going to do, he's going to exalt you. He's going to use you in ways that you couldn't even think of. So we as Christians shouldn't have that self-centered attitude. Like, you know, many people we found in the Bible, you know, Elijah thinking he's the only one serving God, the devil where he wants to be lifted up. You know, we should be people who are humble. And the best way, way to cure eye problems where we just think about ourselves is where we think about others. We go out soul winning. The most, one of the most humbling things is taking time out of your own day to preach to someone else who's lost. I think that's a really humble thing that, you know, and going to the ghettos and places that you wouldn't normally go, but now you're going because you have a, you're, you care about lost souls. And that's something, that's something that can help you stay humble and help you have a, the right attitude and spirit with God. So then, you know, in that, that, when we do those things, when we humble ourselves, then God can lift us up and God can use us in a great and mighty way. 